There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's face. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, Rejoice to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as sea, wash all my sins away. 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 In this poor lisping, stammering tongue, my silent in the grave. In it, a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to say. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our service. We're glad that you are here. Uh, just a handful of announcements. Uh, next Sunday, being Easter Sunday, uh, we're praying for that service, and we're praying that, uh, that the Lord would bless us with His presence. Uh, but uh, we are having an egg hunt for the kids, and uh, if you would like to donate some eggs filled with candy, uh, if it's good candy like shock tarts, you can put it in my office. If it's anything else, you can leave it in Brother Nick's office. Uh, but that again, that is next week. April the 9th, there is a teen rally. Uh, they'll be going to Jacksonville. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer for that. Cost is $10 per teenager from 4 to 11 uh, there on uh, April the 9th. Uh, April the 11th, our teen girls Bible study. Uh, April the 17th, juniors uh, are taking a junior activity to Simply Natural uh, Creamery. Uh, and then uh, April the 18th, uh, directly after the morning worship service, we'll have a King's Daughters meeting. A couple of things that aren't on the, uh, uh, the bulletin that you got this morning or this evening. Uh, April the 25th, we are planning a baptism Sunday. Uh, April the, the 25th, that Sunday evening, we'll be having baptism. So if you have given your heart and life to Jesus Christ and have not followed through uh, with believers' baptism, I would love to talk with you about it. And uh, uh, you can approach me and come to me anytime, talk to me about that, uh, and we can uh, make sure that, uh, that you become uh, or that you are scheduled to be a part of our service. Uh, and then that following week, which is May the 2nd, uh, we are having uh, church membership. We have a handful of folks that have a desire to join the church, and so that's always a good thing. Amen? Amen. I'm glad a couple of you are awake. It's always a good thing to have folks want to join the church. And so uh, that'll be May the 2nd. If you would like to, uh, to take part in that service, to become a member, again, I would love to talk with you about it and go over some things and, um, uh, and, and look at what the Lord has for us concerning church membership. But uh, you can see me anytime about that. Church cleanup uh, Sunday afternoons, if you would like to, your family would like to volunteer to help out with that, we'd be very thankful to sign up sheets there in the foyer. And then uh, this, uh, this week, Emmanuel Church in LaGrange is having a uh, revival with uh, Wayne Johnson, a very good uh, preacher, dynamic preacher. 
Um, and so we'll, uh, we're planning. I haven't made any specific plans, but I, I, I'm planning on being there at least either Monday or Tuesday evening. Uh, if you would like to go and uh, maybe need a ride or maybe we'd like to schedule something or you can just meet us there either way. It's just up the road a little ways. Uh, but that is this uh, week. And so... Amen. That's all that I have as far as announcements uh, at this time. We hope that you enjoy as our choir sings for you. Yeah. 
Amen. That's a good song, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad for the empty tomb? Amen for that. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing this next song. It's a newer one. Some of you may know it. If you don't, I encourage you to really think about the words. Uh, Jesus already came once, but he's coming back again one day, and we're, and we're eagerly anticipating that day. So if you would, worship together with me as we sing, O oh, Glorious Day. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. And that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him from rising again. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day, glorious day. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one bringing. My Savior Jesus is mine. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day, glorious day. 
O oh, glorious day. Amen. What a glorious day it's going to be, too. Thank you so much for that great singing, Pastor. Amen. Uh, at this time, we'll ask our ushers to make their way to the front. Uh, we're going to take up our um, uh, Sunday. I about said Wednesday evening. I'm been one of them days. Amen. Uh, we're going to take up our Sunday evening tithe and offering our opportunity to give back to God. Uh, he, we should be faithful in giving him what he requires out of us, which is our tithe, and be faithful uh, to give according to what he leads us to in our offering. And so this is our uh, opportunity. I'm going to ask Brother Sam, would you pray over the offering? Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we praise your holy name, dear God, that we can come into your presence tonight and sing praises to you, dear Lord, to hear your word proclaimed, dear God. And we, we thank you, dear God, once again for this time of the service that each and every one of us can take a part in it, dear God, to be able to give back a portion of that that you so richly blessed us with, dear Lord. And Dear God, we pray that you would take it, dear Lord. Give us the wisdom to use it in the most effective way, dear Lord, to win the most people for Christ. Well, dear God, that, as you know, is what it's all about. And always give us that desire, dear Lord, to see the next person saved. For it's in Christ's name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We are, at, well, from those of you that were here this morning, you know that, <clears throat> that I preached my voice almost completely gone this morning. It almost went out completely twice, and so uh, I, was, I had a sermon ready for this evening. I'm hoping the Lord will let me preach it another time, but uh, I felt as though he was leading me somewhere else. Sometimes he has to uh, be a little bit forceful with me and kind of telling me to just shut your mouth and, and do what I tell you to do. And so that's, I'm guessing that's what his plan was for that. Uh, my voice doesn't uh, sound all that bad right now. About two hours ago, I couldn't hardly say anything. And so um, <clears throat> uh, uh, I looked at a, a section of scripture that the Lord had laid on my heart uh, within the last uh, couple of months. And uh, I've really been thinking about it and the realities of what, uh, what we're going to face and what uh, even our children are going to face uh, in the future, and those kind of things, uh, they uh, they can make uh, me feel a little reserved. I'm not afraid of what they're going to face because the same God who leads me is going to be able to lead them, uh, and I have faith and I have trust in Him. Uh, but it does break my heart, and it does cause me as a dad to uh, to maybe worry a little bit for them. You'll remember uh, when all of the COVID stuff hit, and we just saw that uh, you know uh, the the realities of Scripture unfolding. And I I asked on a Wednesday night to pray for. Uh, for my kids and uh, to make sure that they knew that they were right with the Lord and uh, they uh, they gave us the assurance that they were and that, that was an exciting and a, uh, a peaceful and uh, a good time for, the, for that to happen. Uh, but when we see everything that's going on in society, um, it's got to cause us to sit back and, and think a little bit. 
cause us to wonder and maybe maybe question not a, not in a way where we're not trusting God but questioning God uh, you, uh, uh, c could you give us an understanding of your timing can you give us an understanding of uh, of why this is happening not that we don't trust him uh, but just wanting to know a little bit more when I first answered the call to preach, God gave me an enormous burden for youth. And I told everybody at my home church, not that I'd answer the call to be a pastor, but I told everybody I answered a call to be a youth pastor. A lot of that had to do with uh, maybe some of the things that I went through, some of the things that I saw, some of the things that I experienced uh, as a child and as a teenager. And my desire was that young people not have to go through some of the things that I went through or uh, some young people not having to learn the lessons the hard way, like some of us had to, because we were unwilling to listen to others. I was a youth pastor uh, for six years. And the reality is the Lord has never taken my burden away from youth. Youth is, is vitally important and youth is the church of tomorrow. We understand that. If you look at our uh, church budget, the vast majority of our, uh, of our spending as far as outside of just the, uh, the staff, if you look at our budget, the vast majority of it goes to youth. And there's a good reason for that. We want to be able to reach them at an early age to keep them from having some of the regret, the regret that we have. Amen? We want to share with them the, the gospel truth, what uh, God's plan for their life is, and how uh, God uh, makes him, can make himself real in their life. When I think about what they will have to endure, it breaks my heart. Amen? When uh, ju just in the last handful of months, seeing some of the things, it, you know, our society is tearing itself apart, and that, that's that's unfortunate. Our country's tearing itself apart. That's unfortunate. Uh, we we recognize that. We pray about it. We pray for those in leadership. Uh, but the reality is, we need to be praying for our youth. We need to be praying for the, the youth in, in America and across the world. We need to be praying for, uh, for leaders. We need to be praying for, uh, for preachers and for uh, folks that are willing to tell them the truth, to share with them uh, the realities of heaven and hell, the realities of guilt and innocence, the realities of uh, righteousness and uh, unrighteousness, and the, uh, the realities of God being uh, our judge, our all-knowing, omnipotent judge. But thinking of what they'll go through and what they're facing now. By, by the way, just the, uh, in the last little bit, just the, the music that's become mainstream, the artists, the things that they're talking about and describing and, and the videos and, and what society is just forcing down our throat as the norm. Just, just in mu music is filthy. The music that, uh, that's mainstream is absolutely disgusting and, and we should do everything we can to keep our young folks from, uh, from indulging in that kind of activity. Entertainment. Our teenagers, for the most part, not all of them, but for the most part, they all uh, carry the same thing that the adults do, this little supercomputer. The computer uh, that we recognize as our cell phone, our smartphone, has more technology in it than all of NASA had when they put somebody on the moon. They have unlimited access to the most vile and disgusting things that this world has ever seen. It's all just a, a click away. And by the way, uh, I'll share this with you. This la in, in the last two weeks, both Jamie and I both got a text message from someone uh, in the text message. They knew my name and they said, uh, hey, Cody, I saw this and thought maybe you'd be interested. And when opening it up, I about threw my phone in the toilet because that's, that's all that was on there. And I had to have Jamie erase and block all those things. And then the very next day or the day after, uh, she got the similar kind of text message. And I've heard from some of, uh, of y'all here the same kind of thing. It's not that we even have to go looking for it. It's seeking us out. We know our weaknesses. We've been dealing with them for a long time. And it breaks my heart to think that my children, the children in this church are going to, uh, to have to deal with that as, as those things become more and more prevalent. When I was in Oklahoma, they've, uh, Oklahoma has uh, uh, legalized medical marijuana, but there's no checks and balances with it. And so on every single corner in uh, the, the town that, that I part, part of my life I grew up in, every single corner had a marijuana dispensary where anybody uh, over the age of 16 could go and get anything that they wanted wanted to light themselves up for the next handful of hours. 
Now, it hasn't come to Kinston yet, but I can, I can let you know this, it's going to. They're already setting up the stores for it. The, uh, uh, the different uh, kinds of smoke shops and all that that's coming through, they're, they're setting it up for it. And I believe with all my heart, I, I, I've, I don't say this in a prideful way, I've tasted everything that this world has to offer, I've tried it all, and I know that, uh, that things like marijuana and alcohol are gateway drugs that just lead to harder and harder things that ruin and destroy lives. When I think of what our kids are going to have to face, it breaks my heart. That's why we hired Brother Nick and gave him a, a, a full-time salary and doing everything we can to make sure that he doesn't ever have a desire to leave. Him and Miss Nowatis being, uh, being one unit that, uh, that functions together and works together with our youth. And uh, we can see in them their excitement and uh, we can see in the youth their excitement about the things of God. And th th that's why we do what we do. When Nick first got, uh, where is Brother Nick? When Nick first uh, answered the call to preach, I told Jamie in confidence, I said, one day I want him to work for me. And it was many, many years later the, uh, when, when you, you remember our former youth pastor, Brother Josh, when he said he felt like God was calling him to pastor in, in Tennessee. Uh, I, you know, it was a little bit of a blow, but I said, I understand. And Nick is the only person uh, who came to my heart and came to my mind. He's the first person I called and the only person I called. It was months and months and months before I talked to him again about it. But the Lord knit our hearts together and uh, brought us to the place where, where we recognized that there was a need right here in Kinston at Tabernacle Church. And uh, we recognized that Brother Nick and Miss Nowatis were perfect for that position. And they've been doing a good job. Amen? Last, uh, last week we voted on bringing a, on an intern. And uh, it, the, the budget that we had proposed, it passed 100%. Before, when we had uh, an intern, you remember Brother Fuad and how he worked with the music, and, and boy, it, it, would be, it would be quite a bit easier on me as pastor if, if we had somebody to work with the music, do the choir, and it'd, be, uh, it'd uh, take a load off Brother Nick uh, having to uh, pick and lead congregations. Not that we dis dislike it or anything like that. It's just uh, more things that we've got to do makes our day a little bit more hectic. And we could pay an intern to do and to work with our music. But I'm thankful the Lord is allowing our youth ministries to grow by leaps and bounds. I mean, if you go down on a Wednesday night down in, uh, to, to the other building and you'll see 40 or 50 kids down there. And by the way, that's without even running our buses. That, that's without uh, having the bus ministry, which by the way, we're going to pray and ask God to, uh, to do what's necessary to allow us to do that again. Last week we voted to bring on that intern position and I asked somebody uh, or a couple uh, months back to be praying about it. And so we're going to bring Brother Mark and Miss Amy Coates on. They're going to be a, uh, he's going to be our uh, part-time juniors pastor. And he's already working with the missions and doing the Spanish ministry. Uh, they have the right attitude. They have the, uh, the right desire. They were on the mission field for years. And uh, they uh, worked with children for years and years. And just an awesome uh, couple that we have grown to love. They're, they're a part of everything that happens. And, uh, and we're excited about Mark and Amy coming on. But there's a reason for it. Here's what the Bible says in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, we see, uh, we see Jesus and uh, he is there and some of his disciples get, get upset with something that takes place. Because uh, even well-meaning, well-informed and, uh, and sincere Christians lost track of the big picture, lost, lost sight of the big picture, I could say. Mark chapter 10, verse 13 says, And they brought... Young children to him, that he should teach them, or I'm sorry, touch them. 
And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall receive uh, or shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he hath or he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. We see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ having a concern, a compassion for children. Breaking these uh, verses down uh, just real quick, uh, we see in verse 13, they, uh, they brought him unto him uh, that he should, uh, with the hopes that he would touch them. Those parents and those guardians that brought these children to Jesus, they had heard uh, what God could do. They heard of healing, but, it, but it, it doesn't even give us an understanding that all the children that were brought were there for the purpose of being healed. It was more for the influence they desired that, uh, that something that Jesus had, his, uh, his, the way he carried himself, his righteousness and holiness and uh, his reverence for God and uh, the, the, we, they could recognize the power of God resting on his life and his ministry and their desire. If we could get our children just to be in the vicinity so that they could uh, be influenced by him and just be touched by him, it would make all the difference in the world. And yet the disciples, when they saw that, kind of thought it was a waste of time. Uh, when, when we were in Michigan, there was a, uh, a fellow that came to an association meeting. They're, they're always boring and, and weird anyway to have an association meeting, but we were there and uh, a fellow gets up and uh, I understand where he was going with this. He was talking about his personal ministry. It was a terminally ill ministry, a great ministry to have. Uh, and he would reach out to those that were at the end of their life and making sure that they were, uh, that they, uh, were ready for, uh, for their life to come to an end and for them to step out into eternity. And uh, that, that was his desire. That was his, his passion and what he was trying to do. And, uh, you know, when you pour your heart and your life and your, your soul and uh, all of your strength into a ministry, boy, it consumes you. And I can understand this statement that he made, but I don't agree with it. He said the terminally ill ministry is a ministry that is neglected by most churches and yet it is the most important. I understand where he was going with it. But if the most important ministry in your church is a terminally ill ministry, your church is terminally ill. The reality is we've got to be grooming the next generation. We've got to be uh, instilling in them the truths of, uh, of God's word. We have to instill in them uh, the realities uh, uh, of what the Bible teaches. We need to uh, be teaching them the, uh, the, the, the Bible stories about God's, uh, God's power, his ability to overcome. We need to talk about David and Goliath and Daniel and the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, talking about uh, Noah, and the parting, uh, or Noah and the ark and Moses and the parting of the Red Sea. I'm getting ahead of myself, amen? We need to be teaching them them stories. We uh, uh, instilling Stealing in them the, uh, those truths are not fables. They're not something made up by men. These are actual events that took place in history. And each one of them point to a God that is more powerful, has more capability uh, in just his breath than this world has to come against them with. Instilling in them these truths is it's, it's vitally important. If we give the, get them to understand, if we get them uh, to the place, if we lead them to the cross and lead them to that place of decision, and at an early age they choose to follow Christ, we don't have to worry about the terminally ill ministry because it takes care of itself. I'm not downplaying that ministry in any way. But we can understand, we can recognize Jesus. Uh, one of Jesus' focus that he had in his life and his ministry was on children. The parents, the guardians, if, if they could just get him to the place where, uh, where he could touch them, influence them, it would make all the difference. And the disciples thought that it was a waste of time. We could be doing something better with this time. We only have Jesus for a little while. 
I love the fact that Jesus responds with much displeasure. Amen? Why was it he was much displeased? He was much displeased and said to them, Suffer the little children to come unto me. Let them in my presence. Don't, don't let them think that they're not as important as the next guy. Don't let them think that there's anything, uh, that they're any less than anybody else. They're just as important. Jesus didn't just uh, uh, come to live a, uh, a perfect life and die a perfect death so that, uh, so that folks at the end of their life could come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He came, lived, and died for children. And then we see him using them as an example. He says, by the way, disciples, by the way, adults that are here, if you come uh, to me or try to get into the kingdom of God in any other way than this same kind of childlike faith, you're going to be sore displeased as well. It's not going to work out the way that you had intended for it to work out. And then we see probably one of the most uh, tender-hearted and compassionate scenes other than the, uh, the scene of the cross and Jesus dying for all of humanity. We see Jesus in verse 16 take them up in his arms. Put his hands upon them. This is... You know, we, we live in a, a time in our life where, uh, where even the uh, religious leaders and those that should know better and that teach better, uh, that they're making poor choices and doing stupid and disgusting things. And when we, we look at a verse like this, you know, uh, sometimes we, uh, as preachers, we say, man, I don't want to say that, not because I'm afraid of preaching the whole counsel of God, but I don't want to uh, produce in anybody that, the, the thought of maybe anything inappropriate. Jesus never did anything inappropriate. This picture of him touching, uh, laying his hands on them is a picture of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he takes them up in his arm, lays his hands on them. This is a picture of him being so uh, overwhelmed with his compassion for them that he is praying for them. God, do something great in their life. God, protect them. God, help them to make wise choices. Father in heaven, do what's necessary uh, for them to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ at the early age. That's what we see happening here. Taking him in his arms, putting his hands upon them, and blessing them. I'm thankful for our increase in the youth ministries, both the teens and the juniors. Not because of numbers, but because of potential. Because we have the potential to instill in them these truths. We have the potential of leading them to the place where they make a choice for Jesus Christ. Where they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and dedicate their life uh, to service. We have that opportunity. That's, uh, well, there's great potential in great numbers. The potential of what they could possibly be. What they could possibly do. What, what God can do in their life and through their life. What victories they could uh, mount. How many souls that they themselves could win. There's great potential in every child. God's given us an amazing opportunity to leave a lasting impression on, on these young people. To lead them to make decisions that will have a positive result throughout their life and throughout eternity. To instill in them the truths of God's word so that so that they don't have the regret that some of us have. How is it we can do this? How is it we can be successful? How is it we can capitalize on the blessing that God is providing for us of young folks? With all that they will face, our young people are going to need all the help they can get. Because our world is absolutely broken. 
I don't want my children to be consumed with sexual sin. I don't want my children to be consumed with uh, drugs and alcohol. I don't want my children to be consumed with money, the love of money, greed. I don't want them to be consumed with perversion. So how is it that I can do my part in bringing people to Jesus, bringing children to Jesus? How is it I can do my part in making sure that those that I have influence over, not as pastor, but as someone that they see every week? How is it that I can ensure uh, that they make those right decisions? How is it that I can uh, leave that kind of lasting, eternal uh, impression on them? How is it that I can make a difference in the life of a child? The difference came by those that brought them to Jesus, not by those that were that were angry and thought it was a waste of time. The difference was made in, in those that brought these children to Jesus. The reason that uh, he had influence, the reason that they were able to feel his warm embrace, the reason that uh, he laid hands on them and prayed for them and blessed them is because there were faithful people willing to bring those children to where Jesus was. Do we believe that Jesus can make a difference? Yeah, I do. I believe that, uh, uh, that having Jesus as a part of our life can, uh, can take a, and completely reform and reshape a future. I believe it with all of my heart. I believe every young person that's in here is potential to do something great. That's why we uh, bring Nick on and Miss Noatis on and Brother Mark and Miss Amy on. That's why we uh, devote all of this time and all of this effort and all of this money because God has given us a great opportunity with endless potential. And so, uh, what is it that I need to do? What is my part in what's happening here? I heard a great sermon uh, about a month back on, on revival, and there are so many folks that, uh, that, are, uh, that, that, that have that doom and gloom mentality that say that this world, according to Scripture, it's, it's not going to experience another revival like we've seen in the past. There's just, there's no room for it. And uh, this world has got so far away. And uh, I can understand the mentality. I can understand the, the train of thought that leads them to that position. But I serve the God of the impossible. I, I believe that revival is still something that can take place. They were looking for Jesus' return uh, uh, minutes after he died. Or minutes after he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God. They said, look, he could come back at any moment. And we see scripture unfolding and we say the same thing. He could come back for, uh, at any moment. But the reality is it could be another 20,000 years. Can God send revival? Absolutely. Can God revive uh, a youth, a generation of youth? Can God uh, mold and shape their lives and bring them up and, uh, under people willing to disciple them and in uh, local assemblies of the body of Christ that care enough and are concerned enough that they're instilling truth? Can God do something great in their life to where they could reach the world, reach the masses? Absolutely. Absolutely. If our God's not able to do that we have a warped idea of who God is if our God is so small that he can't uh, rise above the, what is the norm or he can't rise above what is accepted or uh, what men can conjure up in their own mind that's a small God that we serve but that's not the God of the Bible in that sermon I was talking about where uh, the preacher was talking about revival can revival come most of the time when I'm preaching a message, I get to the closing of it, I get to the invitation time, and, and I rehearse, I go over different ways of saying that the Lord leaves the responsibility to you. Salvation. He's done everything that's necessary for you to experience salvation. If the Holy Spirit is calling, Jesus Christ has already paid the penalty. He says, if you will believe and confess, if you will believe and confess, if you will make the choice to follow him, understand this, revival always started with one individual. Someone consumed with the power of God, the will of God. Over, uh, overwhelmed with uh, uh, the state of those uh, that were around him and compassionate and, and concerned enough to be willing to do something about it. So the question of if revival can come boils down to me. 
Am I willing to be what it takes to have revival start in me? Boy, that's a, that's a tough statement, amen? Am I willing to be? Am I willing to listen? Am I willing to sacrifice? Am I willing uh, to do all that's necessary in order for God to show up in a way that he promised he would? I hope for our youth the answer is yes. I hope for the sake of those that we love that the answer that we give inside of our own heart and our own mind is a resounding yes. I am willing. Second Chronicles, very familiar section of scripture I quote it all the time. Chapter 7 verse 14 gives us the key of how we can experience this revival. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. That's a picture of revival, isn't it? So the question as we're thinking about and pondering bringing children to Jesus and that making all the difference and as we think about what it is that they're going to have to face, I mean, uh, society is attacking them, uh, attacking their gender, attacking the, uh, the, the, the color of their skin, attacking uh, the way that they're raised, attacking them on every front. They feel shame just to, uh, to, to be what the doctor says that they are. They feel ashamed. Uh, uh, they feel out of, out of place. They, uh, they get mocked and ridiculed and pulled every single direction. What is it that I can do to make sure that my children and the children that God has put in, in the care of this church, me as a member of this church, what can I do to make sure that they get to the place where they accept Jesus Christ as Savior and they, uh, they have a desire to please Him and serve Him and uh, they dedicate their life to living for Him? What is it that I can do? What's my part in that? My part is to humble myself. Not think that I've got everything under control and that I have all the answers and that, uh, that I am supreme in any way and that there's anything special about me. Humble ourselves and pray. Can revival come? The answer is, will you pray? If you'll pray... A real prayer, a heartfelt prayer, a prayer of humility. Yes, revival can come. Yes, there are uh, these uh, young folks underneath uh, uh, our teaching and in our care have an opportunity, have a potential, a good potential future if we'll pray. How about seeking his face? Are we willing to do that, church? How about turning from our wicked ways? You know, the story in the Old Testament where uh, Achan was, was forbidden to take anything and, and yet Achan took those things and uh, he took it into his tent and he buried it in the ground and he thought nobody knew about it, but as a result of him doing something that God forbid, uh, it caused the death of, uh, of soldiers and it caused uh, the armies to start losing because one person had did what was wrong in the eyes of God. The Bible teaches us that if we'll turn from our wicked ways, it'll have an influence and it'll impact our society. But I think God's church oftentimes is unwilling to turn from their wicked ways. They'll excuse it and justify it, sweep it under the rug like it's not that big of a deal. All along we're leaving our young folks exposed to the wrath of God and the wiles of the devil. He says, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive them of their sin and I will heal their land. The folks that made the different in the life of these young people were the ones that had enough spiritual integrity and understanding to say, 
If I can get them to a place where Jesus has influence over them, it'll make all the difference. That's what God is doing for us and allowing our youth to get big. Again, it's not about numbers. It's about the potential that exists there. God's given us this amazing opportunity. What are we willing to do about it? 